Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk to you about 3D visualization with an S and uh, Blender and, and, of course, FME. So a bit about me. Um, I'm from the UK. Um, I work for a company called Arup, which I'll tell you a bit more about. I'm a certified FME professional, and uh, I guess my, my main job is GIS analyst or data analyst. Um, but I like to make things with FME for no reason in particular, just for fun. I like to uh, carry out my own research in my own time. Um, so all of these images here are things that I've made with, with FME on its own, mostly with the, the Mapnik rasterizer, which I think is, is a great tool. So this is data-driven visualizations, but also um, using FME to create things um, from scratch, so using creators to actually uh, create things like trees and, uh, and graphics and that sort of thing. So a bit about um, Arup, the company that I work for. We're a, a global business with a, a current revenue of over uh, a billion pounds. We uh, employ over 12,000 people in 89 offices worldwide. And we, to date, have worked on about 14,000 projects in 146 countries. So um, we have a, a, a sort of mantra of uh, better, uh, not cheaper. And um, we have some values instilled in us by our founder, Ovarup, who, um, uh, who said a number of things, including um, our work should be interesting and rewarding, only a job well done, and as well as we can do it, and as well as it can be done, is that. We must therefore strive for quality in what we do and never be satisfied with second rate. Arup um, was founded in 1946, I think, and is traditionally a civil engineering company, but has grown to cover these, uh, these main businesses. So architecture, aviation, digital, energy, highways, uh, management consulting, rail, uh, planning, and uh, water. These are some, uh, a few notable projects that Arab has worked on over the years. So things like the Sydney Opera House and the Pompidou Centre. Um, high Speed Rail, so High Speed One in the UK. And the uh, Olympic Developments, so that's the Bird's Nest uh, Stadium in China and the London uh, Olympic Village. Now, day to day, my sort of bread and butter is... Um, largely taken up by this project. So this is a project in the UK uh, called HS2, which is a high-speed rail project, and Arup has won a number of contracts for the design and environmental impact um, for this railway. So believe it or not, we don't have um, high-speed rail in the UK yet, um, but it's something that's it's going to go into construction now. To starting um, from London, the first phase is to Birmingham, but then further on to uh, Manchester and Leeds. So that's what I, I do day to day. But I'm not here to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about uh, Blender, which is an app. If you're not familiar with Blender, it's an absolutely fantastic open source, completely free uh, 3D modeling and animation package. So it's similar to uh, Autodesk Maya or 3ds Max or Cinema 4D and it's an incredibly capable application. Um, it supports common 3D formats, and you can also customize it with, uh, with Python scripting. It's also um, pretty good for FME users because it has a, a node-based um, viewer for designing materials and, and compositing, uh, just like FME. So these are some of the um, renders and some of the images that I've done by taking geographic information such as LIDAR and open source data such as rivers from uh, the Ordnance Survey and uh, creating uh, landscape renders. Some more examples, um, again with LIDAR and NASA data. And finally, this is um, some open data from the city of Toronto, which you, using FME, you can convert to an OBJ format so convert GIS data to a common 3D format and then uh, render it in, in Blender. So 
Um, one of the things I really like about Blender is that it's um, constantly updated. There's a team of really dedicated uh, professional developers that are continually updating it, and they can sometimes respond much quicker than, say, some of the traditional vendors. Um, there's a really um, amazing functionality at the moment um, in, in the latest release of Blender called um, Micro Displacement. And, and what that means is basically um, it uses a process called adaptive subdivision. So subdivision is, say, if you had a cube and you subdivided it and you kept on doing that, you would end up with a, with a sphere. Um, the principle is that you could have quite a basic mesh of geometry, say, in the, in the bottom right. And then at the time of rendering, you could then further subdivide that, but you're, you're doing it dynamically, so you're not creating massive geometry. Um, the di displacement comes in where you would use an, an image or a texture to further add detail by um, taking a basic geometry, subdividing it, and then further displacing it. This image was, um, this render was, wasn't done by me, but it was created purely by using a height map of this texture, so much like a, a terrain model, really, or, or a DTM. Um, but what's particularly clever is it, um, the adaptive subdivision will subdivide the objects in the foreground um, so that each pixel in the image would represent a single face of a, of, a, of, a, of a mesh. So the objects in the foreground are subdivided more than the um, objects in, in the background. So it's quite a, an efficient way of subdividing um, geometry based upon the image, and it does it at render time. So I'm going to talk to you about a few projects that I've worked on. Um, recently, I did some work for Trade Me. Um, to produce some high-resolution topographic maps using Blender. So taking geographic information and actually creating a, a 3D model in Blender and rendering it using real lighting and, um, and materials, but producing a top-down orthographic result of a, uh, of a map, essentially. Um, Trade Me, uh, one of New Zealand's uh, <laughs> largest websites, it's a bit like... Um, eBay and what we call Rightmove in the UK rolled into one and they've really cornered the market in New Zealand. And what they wanted was some really large high-res um, custom maps of New Zealand for use on their website and for use in uh, marketing. So the brief was um, to take a large amount of the um, SRTM data that I think Chris Hadfield was talking about yesterday so I had five gigabytes of uh, data to cover the whole of New Zealand. And they wanted separate images for each region, but with a consistent color, color gradient throughout, all, um, for, throughout each region. But they also wanted a, a single composite image for the whole of New Zealand to be uh, a very large image, to be very high res. It also had to be, um, of course, completely georeferenced and orthorectified, which isn't something that Blender supports natively, but using FME, you can um, basically uh, georeference the, the output the renders. And one last thing is that they wanted the background, so everything that wasn't land to be transparent, so um, I needed to use FME to create um, masks to um, create uh, water features and, and background uh, coastline. So how did I do that in FME? So the um, STRM data was huge, but I wanted to use as much detail as possible. So I um, clipped each region separately in New Zealand and reprojected it to New Zealand National Grid so it wasn't in World Grid um, coordinate system. I then use the, uh, the raster expression evaluator to scale the height values from the DTM to fit a 16-bit PNG image, which I would use as the displacement uh, map. And then at the same time of, write, of writing some textures, 
Uh, I would also write a bounding box to an OBJ format, so I had the exact bounding box of each region. And what that gave me was a plane to use as my starting point to subdivide uh, in Blender. Other things that I did is I used the uh, FME raster um, um, cell value replacer to create a really high detailed coastline, just very simply by taking any value that was um, zero or less and uh, get rid of, getting rid of everything else. I did the same thing to create a, a transparency mask using rivers and uh, lakes in FME with the, the Mapnik rasterizer. So what I was left with is a clipped DTM for each region and a coastline. And I would then have a separate layer to add a transparency mask for the lakes and rivers. And then each image was rendered separately in, in Blender. And then the output was then um, georeferenced in FME and clipped to the exact uh, region outline. So this is what Blender looks like, and it's, um, it's quite an involved application, but um, I think if you're familiar with GIS or CAD, you wouldn't really struggle with it. Um, but it's a very capable application. Um, so what we have on the left-hand side is just a very simple plane. So the file size for this, um, uh, this Blender file is, is incredibly small, and it's actually the um, DTM, which at, at, at render time is uh, displacing and subdividing that, that, that mesh to represent the, the height map. In Blender, you have a node-based um, setup like this, which is very similar to FME Workbench, and this is how you control how materials and shaders appear in Blender. So much like an FME, you would connect, connect up um, different tools and functions. Um, what this is doing is layering up all of those different transparency masks and finally adding in, in the output a material for the surface and then a separate value for the displacement, which is the DTM height map. You have the thing called a, a node group, which is a bit like a custom transformer in FME. This is how I would set the styling um, for, the, uh, for the color ramp to be applied to the maps. And what this does is separates the, uh, the Z values from the displaced mesh and then uses that to uh, apply a color gradient, much like you would do in, in GIS. So this is the output. Um, and the output images were, were pretty big. Um, so what FME enabled me to do was to take those um, top-down orthorectified renders, georeference them, mosaic them completely, and then um, clip each region so you would have a separate um, transparent layer. Um, so the, the guys at Trade Me were, were using things like Photoshop to, um, to, to uh, generate these, these images. So um, the other things that I, I do with Blender, unfortunately I can't um, show you because it's, it's quite um, confidential at the minute, but um, I'm using FME I'm able to produce uh, renders of, of site development projects, uh, construction projects. So if you live in North Devon and you work out where this is, don't worry, this isn't a real, um, uh, real development. But it's a typical scenario where you would have some baseline data in GIS, and in the middle there, it would be a, a, a site development, which could be um, a commercial development. And we would have a 3D design in CAD and some baseline data in GIS and probably a, uh, a terrain as well. So what FME is particularly good at is, um, is manipulating surfaces and meshes. So what I was able to do was take a 3D CAD model and using the surface modeler is to drape that model on the surface, take the triangle output from the surface and basically cut the, the draped 3D design against the existing terrain using the area on area overlayer 
which works really well in 3D, and then filter out anything that had an attribute uh, for, the, for the design. So I've got a, a mesh with a nicely cut um, hole in it for the scheme. And then in the same workflow, I converted the 3D uh, CAD design to an OBJ format, draped some buildings, and then in uh, Blender, I was able to then render that view using um, lighting and adding trees and that sort of thing. What I particularly like about using FME for this, of course there are other workflows that you could do, is that it enables you to use the absolute accuracy and precision that GIS data would give you to, um, to, to clip and produce textures. Um, so, for example, we're reading in the height map as an ASCII grid and taking the bounding box and using that to clip things like uh, the aerial photo and then the, the DTM displacement map to use and also things like uh, the tree cover and that sort of thing. So what you're en ending up with is a application that doesn't support um, coordinate systems, but um, you have an exact, exactly clipped texture, aerial photo, um, to, to these, these same dimensions as your surface. And uh, it just produces a very accurate result in the end. So another recent, recent project I wanted to talk to you about was for a company called Albion Cycling in the UK. And they make um, cycling clothing, and it's geared towards the, the British landscape and climate, which isn't, which isn't great. So they, um, they make all of their um, clothing in the UK. But they wanted to produce some um, images based upon cycling and based upon the British landscape. So using um, completely open source data, which is um, fantastic in the UK at the moment. I produced um, a series of images for them to use on their website. And this is a, um, a popular cycling track in, in Mid Wales, in, in the middle of nowhere, but um, they really liked it as a, um, as a cycling route. And how I produced this was in FME, of course, taking um, a digital surface model which had all of the, uh, the, the trees and the detail in the landscape and a digital terrain model of the exact same area. And through the uh, raster expression evaluator, you're able to do, take one from the other. So to take away the, the bald earth terrain from the surface model in this area um, gives you the, the black and white image, which is the, the tree cover. And the image on the right is the sort of top-down rendered view. Um, so it uses a, a process called uh, particle placement to place the trees. And so basically where everything is white, it would place a, a tree object in that location. But again, FME enables that super accurate uh, projection of the texture onto the, the surface uh, because it's derived from GIS data. So I'm going to try and show you now, if I can, what this model looks like. So they wanted some... Where are we? They wanted some stills, some renders, but they also wanted to produce a 3D model. And the way... Um, I, I put that together for them was using uh, a site called Sketchfab. I don't know if anyone's ever used it, but it's a really good tool for, um, for sharing 3D models. It's a bit like YouTube, but for, for 3D. And um, it has some really nice features, such as uh, depth of field, and it supports um, 3D uh, materials. So I don't know if you can see, as, as a pan around, you can get a reflective um, uh, texture from, from the river. It doesn't support attribute information like some, some other sites might, but it's, um, it's sort of a really effective uh, way of, of, of sharing 3D models. What FME enables you to do is to 
produce, using the surface model, a lower poly or a lower res version of the, of the landscape, of the surface. And in Blender, you can export what's called a light map, where you would bake the, the rendered light uh, onto an image, and then effectively that image becomes um, your, or your texture. It's something that's used in video games quite a lot. So rather than having to process all of that rendering and the lighting dynamically, you can um, let's see if this will work. So this is um, a similar model that I produced, but using FME, instead of writing the surface out to an OBJ file, in the same workflow, you can write it out to a uh, file geodatabase multi-patch feature. And uh, taking the, uh, the baked light from, from Blender, you can apply that as a, as a texture to produce um, quite a sort of nice detailed light uh, baked, baked view on there. But of course, it being a GIS version, you could um, have a layer control. So th this is the, that landscape with the, the baked texture on it. You can see it's black where um, all of the buildings and roads are because there's no light that hits it. And it's actually quite a, low, a lightweight, low poly version of the terrain model. And then in, in FME, you can, of course, drape uh, things like roads and buildings and extrude them and produce a, uh, a 3D model. So, just to finish up, um, what I really like about it for me, I think other people have said it, is that if somebody has a, um, a problem, um, complicated data in different formats, um, FME will just make that completely simple. And um, in terms of producing uh, work with Blender, it enables you to add uh, a huge amount of accuracy into uh, what's a traditionally non-spatial uh, application. Okay, so thank you, that's, that's about it. If you have any questions. Producing equivalent kind of 3D landscapes or anything like that at this point in time? I think it was a couple of years ago with that FME visualized and isolated that. Okay. Did you, did you get the, uh, the, the USPS downloads or uh, the, uh, the, the, the IMG downloads and then convert them to FME or did you uh, find some sort of high resolution? Uh, for, for the S SRTM data? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, I used a really good website called Open T Topography, which basically allows you to um, just select an area really simply uh, with, a, with a bounding box for anywhere in the world. And you can download that data as an ASCII, um, ASCII grid file. And it's, yeah, re really recommend that website. Open Topography, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know what the resolution of that, but the FME also has a custom transformer uh, for Map Zen. Is that right, Daryl? Yeah. So that's another uh, tool that somebody's added to FME for grabbing a worldwide uh, DEM data. I don't know what the resolution of that is, Daryl. Can you remember? It's a bunch of different zoom levels, and it depends where you are in the world. Yeah. So I think the US is very good. The Arctic of Canada is also good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so some it, it, has some weird, it has some really weird glitches. Yeah, okay. So glitches in that. Yeah. User beware, I guess. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Yeah, not not so far. Um, so with that STRM data, it was gigabytes and gigabytes worth of data. 
um, but just by um, converting it to a, a PNG image, a grayscale image. You can, you can do that quite efficiently, and particularly with the coastline, which was an 8-bit um, PNG, a very small file, but an incredibly huge detailed image. So not so far. I mean, with, with the um, micro-displacement and this adaptive subdivision, you can take a very simple geometry, very lightweight, low poly geometry, and dynamically subdivide it and make it more detailed using textures and images. So, so some of the things I've done are creating very large surfaces, um, OBJ files using FME. But um, this other technique allows you to just completely do it dynamically. Yeah, um, I'm not much of a coder, to be honest, but with Blender, you can um, use Python scripting. So if, if you knew how, you could um, probably automate a, a, a lot of that, import, export, um, rendering. Yeah, there's, there's some real, really big potential with, with Blender. Yeah, it's was that the from, from Blender, or was that Cinema C? No, that, that was using the, the, the built-in, uh, I think it was Cycles render. But that um, adaptive subdivision technology, so it is, it's just a height map, just like a DTM, but it um, produces that, that 3D geometry just by um, subdividing that mesh more and more and more until it becomes the same number of pixels representing a single um, face of that of that um, mesh. It's re really clever. Yeah, it very yeah, I didn't do it, unfortunately. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks uh, very much, Aaron. I think okay, we better break you. it off there in case people need to move to the next uh, session. I won't be around, I hope, yep. to uh, answer other questions. We'll be back uh, in a few minutes for our next uh, presentation. Thanks okay. very much, Aaron. Thank you.